move from one cardiovascular emergency of aortic dissection to another very prominent cardiovascular emergency, and that is stroke. And I can unequivocally say that every single one of us watching this morning or watching the recording at a later point in time has encountered patients with an acute stroke. And it is one that a condition that is fraught with risk management and potential medical malpractice. And to educate us, give us some more pearls and hopefully avoiding key pitfalls in stroke is a great friend, someone who I consider probably the most prominent and most intelligent EM neurocritical care guru. That is Dr. Evie Marcolini. Evie, thanks so much for joining us on in our emergency cardiology symposium. Just by way of a formal introduction for those of you that aren't familiar with Dr. Marcolini, she is an associate professor of emergency medicine at the Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine, whereby she practices both in the ED and the neuroscience ICU at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire. Many of you have heard Evie on numerous podcast EM Rap and heard her speak at ASEP AEM and numerous other conferences. Evie, it's so great to see you here. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Can't wait to learn from you about pearls and pitfalls and stroke. Mike Winters, thank you so much for that introduction. I couldn't be more thrilled to be here to see all these great friends from Maryland and uh, some of us who have moved away. It's, it's really exciting to be here. I'm going to set up my slides here. Can you see my slides? Not yet, but I know okay. Dr. Bond is probably feverishly working behind the scenes to ensure that we do. Here we go. How about that? Yes. All right. It is really exciting to be here, not only to see all these great friends, but just to be among such great speakers. I am thrilled and I'm really excited to be talking about one of my favorite topics, the brain. Um, in full disclosure, I'm going to go through some cases and some of the cases that I'm talking about to walk us through this are going to be published cases that are in the literature. Other cases are cases that I have worked on and I do some uh, medical malpractice expert witness work. And I want to talk a little bit about that. The reason I do this work, I was hesitant to do it at first, but when one of my mentors at University of Maryland said, listen, we live and work in a litigious society. And if you ever get sued, don't you want somebody who knows what they're talking about to be an expert witness for you? And I thought about that. And that is why I do this work today, because I want to help to make sure that it's not just the lawyers that are taking care of this, but it's the physicians that we have a role to play in making sure that integrity and good medicine is being represented. So let's go through some cases. Starting off with this 40 year old female. Now she's at home and she's hanging out with her family and her mother witnesses her to have a sudden onset severe headache and some slurred speech. She's got some weakness and some dizziness and nausea and vomiting. Now these folks live very rurally. So mom calls right away because she's been educated. This looks like a stroke. She calls dispatch EMS and says, my daughter's having a stroke, please send EMS. Now it's a dark and stormy night, so they can't fly. EMS gets there and when they get there, she's got a headache and some tingling. They put her in the ambulance and they were dispatched for a stroke. So they're thinking stroke. So in route to the hospital, they're doing their Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale and they get zero every time. And they've done it nine times because that's how long the ride was getting to the hospital. So when she's in route, her symptoms have changed. She still has the headache. She doesn't have the slurred speech, but she's got this tingling, this numbness and tingling. And when they're doing the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, of course, she's going to get a zero on that. So they're reporting that they're calling it in. You're answering the phone and you're hearing, we've got a patient who has a headache, who has some tingling and her stroke scale is zero. So what you're hearing is we've got a patient with a headache coming in who has a stroke scale of zero. So you're going to tend to say, I'm taking stroke off the table. 
because you didn't hear the dispatch and you didn't hear the beginning of the story. So it's important to do that. Now, when this case, because you know these cases are going to go to court, um, the plaintiff says, well, you should have called the stroke alert. Well, you were you had an anchor bias because the call-in didn't tell you that she had a sudden onset, slurred speech, et cetera, and weakness on one side. They say if she got TPA within four and a half hours, she would have survived. And the family kept asking for the shot. So that's a problem. Um, when you're looking at this patient, it's really important to go back and get the history from the very beginning. And this really speaks a lot to how we deal with the patient and the family. When mom keeps saying, we need the shot, we need the shot, listen to that. And that's important. Look for those clues. And I'm going to say a few things over and over again. And one of them is go for the worst diagnosis and prove that that's not true before you go to a benign diagnosis. So the uh, the patient took two and a half hours from onset of symptoms to get to the emergency department because they live so far and because the weather was so bad. And that's a problem that you're working against with time. Now, the plaintiff, the defense says in this case, well, the exam was normal except for headache and tingling. And he documents normal movement and coordination. This isn't a great documentation. When you've got a case like this, if there's a neuro problem, document a good neuro exam. As a matter of fact, it's a good practice to get into to document a good neuro exam for every patient. That way it's, it's just second nature and you're, you're documenting and it's there if you ever should need it. And then the kiss of death. This physician actually, when the case opened, went into the chart and changed his document documentation. There are few things that could be worse than to be in a chart or few things more tantalizing to a plaintiff's attorney than seeing that the defendant went into the chart and changed the documentation. It just looks like guilt. And and please don't do that. It's, it's something that you, you've got to stay away from. So this case actually shows us one of the big problems with stroke. It's full of chameleons and mimics. This was a chameleon. It was a patient who had some slurred speech and had some lateral weakness in the beginning. But by the time EMS got her, she had a headache and some tingling. And we've got chameleons all over the place, dizziness, vertigo, nausea. These patients come in all the time and you have to think about stroke. Just put it into your thought process and ask yourself, is this patient having a stroke? And let me prove to myself that they're not. Oftentimes, the best way to do that is just a really thorough neuro exam. And I often say that you can slow down to speed up, which means slow down and do the neuro exam you will speed the time to diagnosis. Instead of doing a very cursory brief exam, and then the patient gets diagnosed a day or so later or hours later, just do the full neuro exam. And the full neuro exam includes walking the patient. So be aware of these chameleons and be thinking about anything that could be a stroke. And I'll tell you this, this is a young patient that's fodder for the plaintiff attorneys, a young patient with a long life ahead of her. And especially if she has earning potential, they're looking at things like that. So think also with these chameleons, somebody who has changing symptoms. If they have symptoms that are in the posterior fossa, like the dizziness, the vertigo, the nausea, altered mental status, and they change, I always want you to think about the basilar artery. The basilar artery is going to get us every time. It's, it's not uncommon for the basilar artery to have a TIA that's later followed by coma. So enough chameleons. There's also mimics. Patients show up looking like they're having seizures. They could be infectious. It could be migraine. It could be tumors. All of these things will mimic stroke, and that's going to be a pitfall for us. And I know that we're we're worried about giving TPA for stroke, 
I'll tell you one thing about mimics. If you do give TPA to something that is actually a mimic, it's a lot less risky with regard to bleeding. Um, 18% of patients with TIA and minor stroke will have a headache at symptom onset. So when you have somebody with a headache, don't write off stroke, be aware of that. So the defense also said, well, she wouldn't have qualified for TPA because she was rapidly improving. And they said, TPA is a dangerous drug. Now I want to talk here about this. First of all, the most common things, the most common reasons that we don't give TPA for patients that are cited are that the patient had a very low NIH stroke scale or a very low score or a mild stroke and or they were rapidly improving. If you ever find yourself saying, my patient's rapidly improving or their score is so low that I'm not going to offer them TPA, please bring somebody in to be on board with you. Call a neurologist, get a consult. If you're ever saying those words, say to yourself, okay, I got to get somebody else to come on board with me. Cause you know, this is the most common reason that we don't give TPA and we're likely to get sued. So, um, this patient was qualified to get TPA and the defendant said, TPA is a dangerous drug. So let's talk about that. I know that some of you out there are thinking this, TPA is a dangerous drug, it can cause bleeding. I know that the literature is rife with problems. I know it's not great literature. I understand that. And there are believers and non-believers about TPA. You know what, TPA is not a religion. TPA is a therapy and it's available to patients. And whatever you believe about TPA, you got to come to grips with it because we as the physicians are the pawns in this game. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Yes, the literature is terrible. Yes, there is a small risk of bleeding, 6%. But if that patient doesn't get TPA and they wanted it, we're the ones who are going to pay the price. So let's look at the guidelines because that's what the plaintiff's attorneys are going to go right to is the guidelines. So the AHA, ASA, the Stroke Association says patients who are eligible for all to place, it's beneficial and treatment should be started as quickly as possible. That's a level 1A recommendation. They do say that the risks should be discussed and weighed against the benefits. And that's a lesser uh, recommendation, but that's there. That's the first guideline that they're going to look at. The next one is our guideline, ASEP's guideline. ASEP is a little more circumspect, right? They say TPA should be offered and may be given to selected patients with stroke within three hours or systems are in place. And you should, you should talk about the increased rec- risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. That's the three hour. They go on to talk about the four and a half hour. And they say, despite the known risk, TPA may be offered and may be given to carefully selected patients. So they're more circumspect, but they're still saying that it's it's an option and it should be offered. What about the neurologists? They just published this paper in 2022 where they talk about consent issues in the management of acute ischemic stroke. It's a really good paper. It's a good read. I would recommend it. In it, they talk about, should we be giving TPA? They say TPA in the three hour window is approved by the FDA. Whereas in the four and a half hour window, it's recommended, but remains off label. Having said that, they still go on to say TPA is first line therapy. Those are words that are going to be used in the courtroom. So coming back to this, whatever you believe about TPA, If you're not going to offer it because you strongly believe that it's not the best thing, what you want to do is talk with the patient about that and document that you had the conversation and that the patient didn't want to have TPA. Here's the problem. If you offer it and the patient wants it, they get it. That's fine. If you offer it and they decline, that's fine too. If you don't offer it 
and they would have declined, you're probably going to skate through. But if you don't offer it and they would have wanted it again, you're on the hot seat and that's a problem. So set aside your thoughts and your beliefs, even if you don't want to give it, bring somebody on board, call a neurologist, talk with the patient, be honest with them, tell them about the literature. If you think that they would understand it, tell them what you know. I'm all for that. And, and yet you need to make the choice, the patient's choice. Okay. Next case. This is a 23 year old young woman, sudden onset dizziness, headache, nausea, vomiting, ataxia. So she was working nights. She was living with her parents and she had some dinner, made a turkey sandwich, went upstairs to have a shower to get ready to go to work. And in the shower, she has a sudden onset of nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and a bad headache. She can't even walk enough to get out of the shower. So she goes to ground. She calls out for her mom. Her mom shows up and calls EMS right away. They bring her into the emergency department. And when she gets in, the medical team does an exam. They do a neuro exam and they say it's normal. And they order imaging. They order a CT and a CTA. So that happens at eight o'clock. So she's in the shower around seven. They're assessing her at eight and they order the imaging. Then shift change happens at 11 o'clock. So a new team comes on. Imaging hasn't been done yet. And they do their own exam. And they say she's got a normal neuro exam. She's still nauseous. The headache's not so bad. They're giving her fluid, antiemetics, all kinds of stuff. And she's getting a little bit better. At midnight, the CTCTA is done and read and it's negative. She's still a little nauseous. She's not quite back at her baseline. And the attending who's on says, well, not really sure what's going on. Let me call neurology. So they call neuro. And at 2.30, neuro shoves up to do a consult. They examine her and say, she's got a normal neuro exam. And you know what? She had this turkey sandwich and mom is there saying that turkey was old. She shouldn't have been eating that. I feel badly. This is food poisoning. So the neurologists are saying, this is food poisoning. She's better. You should send her home. Well, the ED attending, not happy with that, says, um, thank you very much, and consults medicine and gets her admitted. So now she's hanging out in the ED, waiting for a bed upstairs. And at 345, the nurse goes in to check on her, and she is completely back to baseline. She says, my headache's gone. I'm not nauseous. She gets up, she walks around. She's not dizzy. Everything's good. Mom's still there. So she says, Hey, can I take her home? The attending comes in, they do a full exam and it's perfectly normal. And she has no symptoms. And they say, you know what? She's got a bed coming upstairs. Let's, let's just keep her. It, it's four in the morning. And, and for some reason they kept her. So then mom goes home. And then two hours later, the call bell goes off and they go in and she's got left side weakness and slurred speech. Game on. So now they send her to the CT scan right away. They call a stroke alert and they see this. I'm not showing you the whole CT, but what you see here is that basilar artery, right? What is that? Is that a clot? Is that contrast left over from the midnight CTA? They talked about it with radiology and radiology was kind of stumped too. So because they were two hours out from the last known normal, they gave TPA and radiology said, send her to the MRI. We should do, let's go to the MRI and see what's going on. So indeed she goes to MRI and look what they find. A cerebellar and brainstem stroke on the right. This is confusing, isn't it? This case should scare you. I know it scares me. So what essentially happened is that the radiologist went back and looked through the imaging and said, I don't get this. And what he found was the CTA that was done at midnight was misread. And where you can see that yellow circle is the right vertebral artery, which actually had a dissection. It was just a misread. These things happen, right? I don't know where you are, what, who is reading your radiology. And we're really not in the practice of looking at our own neuroimaging, are we? 
I would suggest that this one probably would have been caught by one of us if we looked through it and if we got ourselves used to looking through the imaging. But the other part of this is if the clinical picture doesn't match with the imaging, call the radiologist and say, hey, you know, I was fully expecting to see something on this, but I didn't. Can we go through it? That will have them looking back through it. It's kind of a little trigger to look back through the imaging. When they look through it a second time, they may see that. I mean, this, I'll tell you that the radiologist felt really badly about this, and it was a very blatant miss. But in any case, what probably happened was she's in the shower. She has a vertebral artery dissection. The lumen narrows. She has symptoms. So that lumen is narrowed, causing those symptoms. Eventually, some clot forms and the lumen reopens with time. And that's when the, the clot breaks free and she has a completely normal neuro exam. But then at some point, more clot forms and gets to the basilar artery because they did a mechanical thrombectomy and they got the clot out of the basilar artery. Fortunately, she walked out of the hospital with no deficits. This was a big save. And what do we learn from this case? Well, what we learn is to think about that posterior stroke and to think about the young patient. Now, first, the first part of this is that the NIH stroke scale was zero. The first team that saw her ordered a CT and a CTA, and they said the NIH stroke scale was zero. So we didn't call a stroke alert. I want to take that off the table. NIH stroke scale really tells you about the anterior circulation. If you've got somebody with those chameleons of nausea, vomiting, dizziness, ataxia, any of those vestibular symptoms, you've got to think about the posterior circulation. And remember, when you're thinking about the basilar artery, it is a crazy man. It can start with TIA and with some kind of symptoms that wax and wane, and then get the big one. It's scary. When I see symptoms in the posterior circulation that wax and wane and change, my mind says, basilar artery, you got to think about it. The second is, it was the turkey. How many times have I, how many times have you gotten somebody who comes in and says, nausea, vomiting, and they're, they're feeling sick and you give them fluids and fluids and antiemetics, they get better and you send them home. I've done it. I've done it. How many of those were strokes? This one was, but we got to be careful with that. When the symptoms resolved, you're thinking about that basal artery. Now, this is a young patient and we do tend to think about older patients with stroke. I want you to think about young patients. I want you to think about dissection. And finally, that CTA was negative. Read your own images. Get into the habit of it. I'm not saying that when you read the image, you're going to make the diagnosis and you're going to say there's nothing here, but get into the practice of looking at the imaging. We can do this. Here's some imaging of a patient who was 59 years old, came in with severe hypertension. Severe hypertension is one of those symptoms that we don't think about as being a stroke, but he had it, he was unsteady, he, he, he didn't feel quite right. So they treated his hypertension, but it took a lot. So they admitted him. The next day when he was in the hospital, he was seen by neurologist and they got this imaging. Now, when they were in the ED, he got a CT and it was negative. But this MRI shows a subacute right middle cerebellar peduncal infarct. And you see that that here on the DWI imaging. And you also see it here on the flare imaging. When you see something on flare, that means that it's been there for at least four hours or so. So this happened the day before. It wasn't present on DWI imaging, which I'm not showing you. Message here is the CT has limitations. It's not useful for posterior stroke. When you get a CT and, you know, we order CT all the time with neuro patients. The first thing we order is a non-contrast CT. And I'm not knocking that 
I, we are looking for we're looking for blood when we order that CT, but you need to be careful when you order it to ask yourself, what am I looking for? In the guy with hypertension and headache, you're looking for a bleed, right? But hyper, severe hypertension and headache are both chameleons for a stroke. So you have to ask yourself, should I consider stroke here? And if you are, get some vessel imaging, get a CTA, get an MRI, get a neurologist, do something. Recognize that the CT is going to see just so much, and it's not that much. Here's another one. This is a different case of a patient who had a CAT scan, had some symptoms of ataxia, and look at that CAT scan. It's beautiful. I'll tell you, the rest of the slices are just as beautiful. There's no bleed. It looks per perfect and fantastic. Very soon after that, I mean, within minutes, he had an MRI. And look what it shows. It's just such a striking example of the limitations of CT. So just think about that. When you get a CT, ask yourself, what am I looking for? What is the clinical story that I hope to confirm with my imaging? Here's another case. This is a 43-year-old female. It's Christmas time. She's visiting with her family. They witness her have a sudden collapse. She's unable to speak or use her right arm. Now, this is pretty striking, and the family's pretty freaked out, and uh, they call EMS. And EMS brings her into the hospital. Now, during this EMS trip to the hospital, her symptoms change a little bit. And um, when she gets to the hospital, they don't believe that she's having a stroke. The family thought she was having a stroke. They get a non-contrast CT and it's negative and they call her conversion disorder because they're just not believing that she can't speak and they think that she's not willing to use her right arm. This is, this is a bit of a trap for us. And this is one of the cases that's published online and I'm not really sure why they didn't believe that. But if you think somebody is unwilling to move their arm or their leg or speak, et cetera. Be careful with that. So she gets admitted and she goes upstairs and they do a repeat CT the next day and she's got a large left MCA infarct. That's a problem. This goes to court, of course. The plaintiff says the family implored you to take her seriously. And that speaks to how do we interact with families? Do you remember cases where there was just this antagonism between you and the family? That should be a warning sign for you to say, you know what, I, I got to be careful here because someday I may see this family in court. The plaintiff says, you didn't document a neuro exam. And the nursing note says the patient is unwilling to move arm. That's kind of a tough thing to have in a chart. But the most damning thing is that they said, the emergency physician said to us, your daughter is having a nervous breakdown because of how you raised her. Now, talk about fodder for plaintiff's attorneys. That's gold, solid gold, because there's, it just says you mistreated the patient and the family. They said you didn't consult a neurologist. You didn't transfer her to a stroke center. If somebody's talking about stroke, take it seriously and say, all right, this patient's having a stroke and it's my job to prove that she's not because I may have to defend this. Now, the defense says, well, she wasn't having a stroke and she didn't qualify for TPA. She had rapidly improving symptoms. Um, and this, this is something that I talked about a little bit before, but 25% of eligible patients don't get TPA. That's a statistic that's published. And the most common reason is mild symptoms or rapid, or, or rapid, um, improvement. So if you ever find yourself saying, I'm not going to offer TPA because this patient's improving rapidly. Bring somebody else on board to help you say that. Get a neurologist, get some imaging, 
get the studies. Now, patients with an NIH stroke scale less than five, I've heard this a lot, stroke scale less than five, we're not going to offer TPA. Remember that the stroke scale is only looking at the anterior circulation. So be aware, be wary of that. And even if it's a minor stroke or a mild stroke, as we say, 30% of patients with mild stroke will have poor long-term outcomes. And this is what patients are worried about. And this is what plaintiff attorneys go after is disability, not a misdiagnosis as much as disability. So if these folks have a disability, that's what's going to trigger a case. So the most commonly successful litigation results from emergency physician delay in diagnosis and or the failure to give TPA. If you're going to not offer TPA and you've thoughtfully gone through this and it's probably appropriate in many cases, what we do when we give TPA is we consent the patient. We talk about it. We should be consenting them for not giving it as well and talk with them and say, there's, there's a, a medication. I'm saying that you don't qualify for it and that it's not appropriate for you. And this is why. And document that you had that conversation because patients do sue for the fact that they weren't told that there's this medication that they could have gotten that they turned down or that you said, I'm not going to offer this. And this is why I'm not going to offer it. So what I'm saying is a lot of a lot of language that sounds like defensive documentation. And if it does, then it is because these are cases that are going to sneak up on us. So consent and document refusals. Next case. This is a 52 year old guy who had a headache on the golf course. So he was feeling great one day. He's on the golf course with his buddies halfway through the, the course. He gets a headache and he's feeling nauseous, and he's just not feeling well. He figures, I'm dehydrated, goes to the clubhouse, has something to drink, some lemonade or something, and, and he's hanging out for a bit, and he doesn't feel better. So he says, you know what, I'm just going gonna, gonna to call it today, goes home, has something to eat, and still isn't feeling better, goes to bed, says, I'm going to sleep this off. Wakes up hours later when his wife comes home, and, and she said, what are you doing in bed? What are you doing home, and what are you doing in bed? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. I have this headache that started on the golf course. And he said, yeah, it's a pretty bad headache. So she says, I think we should take you to the emergency department. So they do. They go to the emergency department. And he's seen by the PA, not only by the PA, but the PA who is his neighbor. And the PA's wife does scrapbooking with the patient's wife. So they all know each other. The PA gives him some Percocet, his headache gets better and he's feeling good. He wants to go home. And so PA presents the case to the physician who walks by to say, Hey, I heard you had a headache and the headache's better. And he says, yeah, doesn't walk in the room, says, okay, we're getting ready to discharge you. Says goodbye. And the patient goes home. The very next day, the patient's at work. He's an attorney. He's in his high-rise office, and he collapses on his desk. They take him by ambulance, and they do a CAT scan, and he's got a giant subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's a lot of pitfalls I want to talk about in this case. The first is the plaintiff says, you didn't examine me. And he's right. The physician didn't examine the patient. And the defense says, well, your headache got better with Percocet. Please be aware of making a headache better doesn't mean you know what caused that headache. And we have to think about that aneurysm. We can make any pain better, but you need to think about what caused it. So this sudden onset headache is something that should be a red flag in your mind. Anything that happens sudden onset with neuro symptoms or neuro signs should be a red flag. Whenever I hear sudden onset, my mind goes to stroke. My mind goes to the vascular system. And admittedly, I'm biased, but I want you to think that way too, because I don't want you to miss a case like this. This is such an easy case to miss. 
And the other thing is the PA was neighbors of this patient. That is such a trap. Whether you're treating a neighbor, a friend, a family, a VIP, it's a trap and you need to really either not do it, have somebody else see that patient or be very aware of the fact that with patients that we know or who are VIPs, we're going to do a lot less for them. So this patient had a sudden onset, severe headache. He had a CT. It was negative. He should have had a lumbar puncture or some would advocate for a CTA. ASEP gives us that ability to do that now. Either one, lumbar puncture, CTA, whatever your pleasure is, he needed some more imaging and he needed to, to have this pursued because he actually did have an aneurysm. He had a very prolonged course and rehab, and he never came back to a baseline that allowed him to work. This is a 52-year-old guy who's an attorney. Do you think the case was expensive? It was very expensive. And um, the problem with it is that you can get sidetracked with somebody who you know, or who is your neighbor or your friend or a VIP and do the exam. Even if a resident, a nurse practitioner, a PA presents the case, examine the patient to verify. So let's just take a little sidetrack and ask, what do we get sued for in the world of neuro? The most common thing is the failure to give TPA, it's over two thirds. That's a big one. And we've talked about that. You've got to know that that's going to happen. And I'm not telling you that TPA is good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying, be aware of it and think about how you want to deal with that. Failure to diagnose. This is when you don't get to the diagnosis. You don't do the neuro exam. Failure to transfer. If you're in a center where you don't have access to either TPA or mechanical thrombectomy or advanced care, you want to transfer the patient Otherwise, you'll say you, you'll get um, addressed. It'll say you didn't transfer the patient. He needed to be transferred to a higher level of care. That comes under the umbrella of always bring somebody else on board with you. If you're if you're thinking about stroke, if you're thinking about neuro, and you're saying no, it's not. Be sure of yourself, or and or bring somebody on board to confirm that. We talked about no informed consent or no documented contraindication. Um, delay to doctor's evaluation. This is the patient who comes into triage and is triaged, but not stroke alerted and is sitting in the room with a severe sudden onset headache or with uh, some deficits or something. It somehow didn't get stroke alerted. You got to scan the board for those people and go in and make sure that they're not a stroke alert. And I appreciate our nurses who come and say, I've got a patient in room three. I want you to see if they should be stroke alerted or not. And we, our nurses are really good about that. And, and that's really helpful. Failure to recommend TPA. And yeah, we do get complications and there are lawsuits about the complications. 5%, it's a low number, but we do have that. So be aware of what we get sued for. Well, what about the conversation about who's more likely to sue? I want you to think like an attorney. The attorneys are going after the insurance money. That's what they want. That's their job. And who's going to give them the most? It's a young patient with earning potential who has morbidity, who has a deficit. And stroke is low-hanging fruit because stroke is the cause of most morbidity in, in our country. That's the, the case that's going to most likely cause long lasting morbidity. So if you're a, a plaintiff attorney, a stroke case in a young person is, is it's great. It's gold. So think like that when you're seeing your patients and also think like a patient or a family member. If the attorneys are going after the insurance money, the patients are suing because they felt like they were mistreated. The families felt like they were mistreated. They are going after their anger. I recently testified in a case where the husband had lost his wife through a mistake and 
he didn't really care about the money. He said, I just want to be heard. And he said those words. And so if we think about that, even some patients who are at a medical, have had medical mistakes happen, and I've seen this, where they've had a medical mistake happen, if they felt that they were treated well, they don't even think about lawsuit. It's important to remember. Sometimes it's hard to interact with patients and families, but we have to just remember that if we mistreat them, if we let that get to us, then they're going to be angry. And that's when they're going to think about coming after us. So in, in many cases, everybody gets named 85% of cases get dropped, um, but emergency physicians in stroke are overwhelmingly the majority of the physicians who get named because we're the first to see them in that time-sensitive period. And you know, you have to prove duty, you have to prove breach of duty, and then that there is an injury that had a causation by something that the physician did. Remember that. And you're going to be compared to the standard of care. And what's the standard of care? It's the average physician. It's not a high bar. Every state is different. This is 66 cases of stroke that were litigated. Notice how they clump. Know what the rules and the laws for litigation are in your state, because there may be states that are much easier to get sued in than others. And this final case, I just want to run through to see how much we've learned. This is a real case. 19-year-old female, witness collapse in her dorm room at 11 o'clock. The person who saw her says she was shaking her arms and her legs. She was rolling her left eye back and forth. EMS arrives at 11.20. For EMS, the patient is nonverbal, but she's shaking her head yes and no. She's weak. She's pale. She doesn't have drift, and she's got strong grips. By the time she gets to the ED, she's complaining of a headache. She's got left eye nystagmus, but now she's able to speak. She says, I've never had a seizure before. And the physician gets to the bedside much later. I hope that as you read through this, you're thinking about the posterior circulation. This is a young patient. This is a mimic. They thought she was seizing and they couldn't make sense of the fact that she could not speak and now she can speak. And she says she didn't have a seizure and she's got good grips, but it, it's all over the place. That's when you think about the basilar artery because that's what this was. It was missed. It was caught the next day. She had a very bad course and ultimately was made comfort measures. But hopefully after this talk, you will not miss that case. So do a full neuro exam. Think about your communication with a patient and family. Consider those mimics and chameleons. Sort out your feelings about TPA. Document, document, document with times. Beware of the anchor bias. Start from the worst case position and respect the dizzy patient and know the limitations of your CT and your NIH stroke scale. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, I'll take any questions or answer them in the chat. Thank you, Abby. This is very, very um, scary topic you, you spoke about. And we see a lot of these dizziness, ataxia, undifferentiated dizziness. And, and it's scary just to think about what um, lies behind those. We got a lot of questions. However, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you one quick question, and then I'll ask you the rest offline and post it to the chat. Um, in posterior strokes, TPA is considered first line therapy. And what do you do in cases where the patient comes in with just ataxia, just one symptom of the, of the posterior strokes, would you still give them TPA? That's a great question, Lean. Thanks for, thanks for that. Um, yes, TPA is the standard of care in the posterior circulation stroke. And if they have ataxia and I'm concerned about, it, I want to prove that they either do or do not have the stroke. So I'm going to get imaging that looks at the vessels or an MRI. And, um, when I see that, yeah, I'll give TPA. That's that's a debilitating stroke. Okay. Like thank I said, you. I'm going to ask you all the questions um, in a few minutes and post the answers. Um, thank you, Abby. I appreciate it.